Hey, what's happening, Black people? Welcome to DrVoiceTV.com, the home for intelligent Black people. Uh, my name is Dr. Boyce Watkins, and I am here uh, with you to give you the truth, whether you like it or not. Today, we're going to talk about Richard Sherman. Richard Sherman is a superstar, an absolute superstar. Uh, the brother seems like a genius, Stanford University graduate, but uh, he's in big trouble. He's having a lot of problems right now. And I'm going to give you a breakdown of the Richard Sherman situation that um, I believe <clears throat> you're not going to really see in mainstream media because nobody cares about black people that much. <laughs> you got to love yourself because if you don't love yourself, nobody else will love you. But we're going to break down Richard Sherman and, uh, from a financial angle uh, and also talk about brain damage and all the things media won't talk about. So get comfortable. Please hit that thumbs up button. We're going to get started on drboystv.com right now. Here we are, clan the isms, cataclysm, great. Our people out here struggling, trying to make it in this state. Everybody out here doing it, but we the ones who late. Now, family, we the ones who gotta delegate. Get that money in the power, never be fake. Stick to co sign for three. What did he say? Uh, create jobs, support our own. Educate the same and buy back your home. Got three degrees, triple ten. Three PhDs, now we on the CNN. DBTV, let's talk about negligence. Ignorance is bliss, but we can turn it to intelligence. Please, none of what you hear, half of what you see. Let's break it down here on Dr. Boyce TV. Here we are. Hey, what's going on, guys? My name is Dr. Boyce Watkins. Welcome to DrBoyceTV.com, the home for intelligent black people. If you're not black and intelligent, you may want to get the hell out because this is not the place for you. Uh, we hang out with black people who want to be smarter. Uh, we live by the B1 philosophy. B1 means that we are black first. That means we solve our own problems. We don't wait for Superman. We're not looking for anybody else to do anything special. We don't believe white people are magical. Uh, we believe we can do it ourselves. Uh, we are builders. We are black nationalists uh, in every single way. And if you agree that black people uh, matter to you and that we can solve our own problems and that we should make ourselves our own top priority, uh, please put a hashtag B in the number one in the chat, hashtag B1. Use hashtag B1 uh, anywhere on the internet when you're having B1 conversations. So if you are a B1 type person, then have B1 discussions and uh, talk to other B1 people as much as you can because the rest of the world is a little bit crazy. The rest of the world takes stuff that's stupid and ridiculous and, <clears throat> and they think it's normal, you know, like um, eating a big bowl of Popeye's chicken before you go kill another black person after you give all your money away to white people and go take some drugs. There are people that rap about that, that make music about that. And then when I say that that might not be the healthiest way to live your life, people will look at me like I'm crazy. Well, I'm sorry if it hurts your feelings, but the reality is at the end of the day, if you don't stop the killing, then you then you won't stop the dying. So uh, if you want your community to live and prosper and grow, if you want black men to love black women, if you want black women to love black men and you want black children to prosper, put a hashtag B1 in the chat. Hashtag B1 in the chat. Now I see somebody in here. It looks like we already got a troll. As you know, when you spray the disinfectant, the rodents are going to start screaming. So uh, Big Rob, everybody say goodbye to Big Rob. Big Rob is uh, out of here. You, you are banned. Uh, you're banned from this live, but you might be banned for life. So you keep talking, Big Rob. You might have to go because we don't allow niggatry in this space. Niggatry has no power here. <clears throat> so everybody say goodbye to Big Rob or AKA Little Rob because uh, we just made him little and got his little ass up out of here. All right. So Richard Sherman, give me a yes and no in the chat. Let's start with a yes or no question. I'd like to ask for you guys to answer this. How many of you uh, know who Richard Sherman is? Let's see. Let's start there. How many of you know anything about Richard Sherman who plays for the San Francisco 49ers? Uh, and how many of you know what a <clears throat> how much of a badass? Richard Sherman is on the football field. Uh, give me a yes or no. If you have heard of Richard, if you know who he is, uh, me and my wife are talking about Richard Sherman and she is a, um, you know, she is a uh, uh, a therapist, uh, and she but she's not a foot, a big football fan like I am. I'm a big. I like football. I think football's great. Um, I used to love football. I used to play it, and I was pretty good at it. I was. I had I had big, strong thighs, so I was good. And I have a little bit of a muscular build. So uh, in high school, they wanted me to play on the football team because I actually was faster than every single player on the football team. I don't know if y'all know that. That's a little. That's a little. Some Doctor Boys trivia, like at the convention, I might ask y'all that question. How many of y'all knew that I was? You know. But anyway, not that I'm bragging or anything, because I wasn't no serious sprinter. They got real legit sprinters out here, like uh, my boy uh, that actually went to my high school who's running the Olympics. Second, actually, the fast, I think he's the fastest man on earth. His name is Ronnie Baker, and he actually was on the same high school track team that I, that I was the captain of. But uh, yeah, yeah, I actually, uh, they wanted me to play football because I had these big muscles in high school because I used to lift a lot of weights, and uh, all the football players came out to track to get ready for football. So I raced all the fastest players on the entire football team and blew those sons of bitches out the water, and they were like, okay, who is that guy? And 
And uh, the problem I had was um, I have ADHD. I can't, I think I do. I, I haven't di I diagnosed him myself. Uh, so that's why sometimes when I'm talking, I'll go in different directions because, because I, because I never got the, you know, I never got the medication. I, I haven't even taken the vaccine. So, so I ain't got nothing that I'm probably supposed to have. But uh, anyway, uh, the ADHD uh, would make it hard for me to remember the plays. Like I would literally be at football practice and I'd be looking over at the, you know, looking over at the stands and looking up in the sky and thinking about the meaning of life. And then they would say, okay, run a 44 blast. And I'm like, what is a 44 blast? And I wouldn't even know the play. So you can't play football if you don't know the play. So Richard Sherman, as a football player, is clearly smarter than me. Now, as a finance professor, I think I'm pretty good. I think I'm a Hall of Famer in terms of finance. Uh, some people say that. I'll accept that. Thank you. I'll acknowledge that. My, my black black man magic. But, but Richard Sherman, as a football player, um, is the, the best that there is. Uh, this brother is... Uh, he was killing the game. He's an extraordinary athlete, and I hope he gets to play again. Uh, he was um, with the 49ers. He was one of those really great defensive backs that uh, he got a massive contract, I think about $27 million. Uh, he's also interesting because he's very pro-black, which I really love. I, I would call him almost B1. We probably don't agree on everything, but he seems like his head's in the right place. And he also um, went to Stanford. Did y'all know that? How many of y'all know that he went to Stanford? He um, – uh, he uh, was a, a straight A student all through school and he went to Stanford. So stupid people don't typically get to go to Stanford. So uh, God bless him for that. Now, why am I sad though when I talk about Richard Sherman? Well, Richard Sherman just got arrested. Um, he had a really bad incident uh, with his, um, I don't know if it's, I got to look at, I, mean, I don't know if it's his wife. It's, uh, I know his father, it's, I think it's his wife. So his father in law. And I'm not going to go into the details because I am not here to rub it in I just, just to give you full information though and you can look it up you can google this out there but basically there was an incident where he was allegedly according to police dr drunk driving uh wrecked the car went to his father-in-law's house banged down the door had to get taken down by police you know because you know they're scared to death there's this <laughs> this guy and they all know who he is right because he's a superstar he's not just a regular player and he's got this it's super nfl super strength right and you can't tell me for one second that some of those guys you know that, that in addition to lifting weights a lot of them take steroids and everything and uh and he's also in a tough state he's in the, he's feeling bad that day nobody knows exactly why and i'm not going to speculate on that i just want to give you the context and turn and, and explain why i'm talking about richard sherman but as you guys know on dr boys tv one thing we try to do is I like to take the conversation to a higher frequency. Uh, sure, we can gossip about what happened with Richard and why and everything else. Um, but I'd rather go a little deeper and talk about him as a, as a black man, as a human being, and talk about you more importantly. And, and many of your sons, uh, you know, are playing football, thinking about playing football. And I'm not here to tell you not to send your son to play football. That's fine. I'm not judging that. You know, I used to beg my mother to let me go uh, to play summer football with my friends because I played in my in the neighborhood with my friends. Like I thought well, if you'd asked me when I was 12, what are you going to be when you grow up? I would have said I'm going to be a football player with the Dallas Cowboys. I swear to God, that's what I would have told you, not knowing how much competition there is, not knowing how extraordinarily athletic those guys are. Um, I was a good athlete, but I wasn't like those guys. Those guys are superhuman almost the black man is a superhero we're the closest modern living thing to a superhero and so uh so so i'm not knocking football right but here's what i want to really talk about and keep it 100 with y'all um hit the thumbs up button please hit the thumbs up button if you haven't done it yet we really need your support uh because not everybody is uh giving the truth to blackness and, and we so we need to be strong right so one of you needs to be worth 10 of them and you know who the thems are um the negro naysayers the white supremacists everybody else I need y'all to be stronger than them. So if you could take take a moment, hit the thumbs up button, hit the share, subscribe, all that stuff, and uh, help us, you know, make this thing work. So, um, so here's the deal. Well, Richard Sherman, after I, I, you know, I got really sad about what happened to him, um, and I heard, you know, the, these these stories allegedly, according to media, that he was, you know, that he was very suicidal. That he kept, you know, threatening to kill himself. According to the nine one one call, when his wife called in, she was saying that he's threatening to kill himself and stuff like that. Um, first thing I thought about, let me tell you what happened. So I'm sitting next to my wife. My wife is a beautiful black woman who happens to be um, a therapist. Uh, so she's an expert on the human brain. She's a full professor of social work. Not many black m women ever get to become full professors. Not many white men become full professors. That's a big deal. So she's smart. She's one of the best in the world at what she does. First thing she said was she said, um, one of the signs of CTE, meaning brain damage for NFL players, that's what they call it, CTE is suicide. And I said, really? And I Googled it. Oh, and she said, I think she said that 
that one concussion, that's what she said. She said one, she said, and, and I got to check the data exactly on this, but it's pretty accurate. She said, she said even one or two concussions doubles your risk of suicide. Did y'all know that? Give me a yes or no if you knew this. Now, mind you, I'm going to tell you what this is coming from. She, uh, when we went to Guyana two years ago, this is not, I'm not just a Negro talking on the internet. I'm not just some guy running his mouth on the internet. There's a whole lot of mouth running Negroes on the internet that don't know nothing about nothing, right? They even talk about me, speculating on me. Ain't never met me, ain't got no data, ain't got no facts. You just talking because because talking loud gets attention in the black community, but, but talking accurate should be more important than talking loud, right? A lot of y'all Negroes talk loud, but you ain't talking accurate, right? So, so I'm talking loud and accurate right now because when, when we went to Guyana two years ago, the reason me and my wife spent the whole semester in Guyana was because they called her in as an expert on suicide prevention. That's why we were there. We were there because she was there to help Guyana with their suicide problem, which has been heavy since Jim Jones went over there and got everybody to drink the poison Kool-Aid. Y'all remember that? Jim Jones, white boy, got all these black people. See, y'all need to stop following these white folks around. Don't disrespect. If you white, I ain't trying to be mean, but y'all need to stop following these white folks because they will get you drinking the poison Kool-Aid. They already got you listening to the poison music. They got you listening to hip hop that's got a black man in front of 50,000 white people saying, die, nigga, die, kill black people. I'm going to go kill that no, right? And they're cheering like, yeah, I killed that no, right? And you're, you think that's cool because they're paying him to say this, right? You're, you're worshiping the wrong things. You're looking up to the wrong people, right? So then when you've got black people dying in your community because they're drinking the poison Kool-Aid, right? The music is the poison Kool-Aid. You, you think, well, it's just music. It's just entertainment. It, it, music. Don't be blaming the music. Do you understand? If you understood the subconscious mind, you would you would understand how ridiculous that statement is because a, 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 a cool song is more effective than a corny commercial any day of the week. And we know commercials work. Corny commercials work like a Coke and a smile. And, and I like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. I like to buy the world a Coke. Remember that? That was an effective ad campaign. That's corny, though. It's really corny. But what's more effective than the corny stuff is when you throw it with a slam and beat and you make it trendy and cool to rap about killing black people. So effectively, most of your Klansmen are not white people. Most of your Klansmen who are murdering black people en masse are people with black faces. That's why that's why that's why the dying keeps happening. You can't figure out why. That's why you're confused. Like, God, why do black people keep dying? We black lives matter. No, they don't, because if they mattered, you wouldn't stop letting people celebrate your death and your genocide. Let's just keep it real right here. This is all connected. Sports and hip hop are connected. So, so so here's where I want to go back to with with well, with all this with, with Richard Sherman. Richard Sherman was suicidal that night, according to the 911 call from his wife. CTE, aka brain damage, you cannot convince me that Richard Sherman did not have CTE, that he does not have it right now. Now, let me tell you why I'm going to, I would bet every nickel in my bank account and put it, put it on a stack of Bibles on my great, on my beloved grandma's grave. I put it on everything that this brother has CTE. Let me tell you why. I'm going to read this to you. Only intelligent people going to get it. The ignorant people going to argue. But, but that's the thing. Talking loud and ain't saying nothing. Talking loud with no information is very popular. So just be prepared. I know the Negro naysayer is going to get upset about this. He's going to argue. He's going to think I'm hating. But let me read this to you. This is according to beingpatient.com. This is Dr. Ann McKee, a neuropathologist at the Boston University School of Medicine, studied the brains of 202 NFL football players. Through autopsies, she and her colleagues found that of the 111 brains belonging to players in the NFL, 110 of them showed CTE. That's 99%. 111 brains studied, 110 of them were significantly damaged. So again, I reiterate my point. You cannot convince me that Richard Sherman, the brilliant man that he is, the awesome brother that he is, B1, great player. I mean, a defensive stopper like no other. You can't convince me that he hasn't taken enough hits to the to the dome to have significant damage up here. Now, here's your problem, though. Here's your problem. Now, if he the, the problem that Richard Sherman has in America, in my view, 
is that he, in case you haven't noticed, he's not a white woman. He's not a white woman. If it's see, if Richard Sherman was a white woman, if he was a Becky, he could just, you know, go before the court and cry some Becky tears and say, you know, the NFL, they tricked me into playing football. They manipulated me. They offered me a glass of wine and, and told me to come up to their hotel room. And they tricked me into uh, joining the NFL. And uh, they forced me to sign my 27, three year, twenty seven million dollar contract with the uh, with the uh, three million dollar signing bonus and the seven million guaranteed. And uh, and and they and they made me go out there and get hit in the head, and now I have brain damage. So therefore, I have no responsibility uh, for any actions that I've taken since that time. Right? I I could not consent to playing football because my brain had so much damage that I was, in the words of the doctor who originally discovered CTE, a doctor by the name of uh, what's the what's the brother's what's the man's name. His name was, he's not, he wasn't a brother. They were the original CTE. They, now, I know about the brother in the Will Smith movie, but the original CTE was discovered by Dr. Harrison Marlin, who used to call it punch drunk syndrome. In 1928, he said boxers have what he called punch drunk syndrome. So the same way, so if he were Becky, he could say, I, was, I wasn't drunk drunk, but I was punch drunk, which is just like being drunk, which means that if, and, and the law says that if you're drunk, you can't consent. So you have no responsibility for anything you've done. Therefore, charges dropped, right? Right. Richard Sherman doesn't have that white woman privilege, right? Richard Sherman is going to be held accountable for every single thing he did that night. I don't imagine, I cannot imagine any, any judge or any court or any jury that's going to say, man, this guy, he's taking so many hits to the head. His brain is probably all fucked up. Um, he's young. I, I don't know how rich old Richard Sherman is. He's probably 31, 32 years old. Um, he, he, uh, he was having a bad time with his relationship, right? Uh, you know, maybe he was feeling hurt. Maybe his wife was leaving him and he couldn't, he didn't know how to handle that. Uh, in addition to the brain damage and, and being drunk, uh, it, you know, and, and then that particular night was out of character for him. They're not going to, I don't think they're going to consider that. I think they're going to say you were a big, scary black man who was threatening to whoop people's asses and the police had to stick the dog on you and to take you down. That's what they're going to say that with you know, they, they, it's, it, I'm, I'm really impressed that he wasn't shot that night. I'm really happy that he wasn't killed that night, right? Because there's no way you can convince me that a bunch of cops are not going to be scared to death when a big six foot something muscle bound black man who, again, the greatest, one of the greatest defensive stoppers in the history of the NFL, a guaranteed hall of famer is, is pissed off and half drunk and, and, and ready to kick somebody's ass. Like there's no way you can convince me they weren't afraid. So I'm impressed that he wasn't killed. And I'm very happy about that. Right? So, so, so here's the reality. Richard Sherman pays a high price to be Richard Sherman. And it's a price that he's going to probably pay for the rest of his life. And, uh, and it makes me very sad. Uh, when I was, um, I went to an event, I have a friend, I don't know if y'all know, I know some people make fun of me because, of, um, because uh, apparently Kwame Brown doesn't like me, right? He taught, he, for some reason I got his attention and he just wouldn't stop talking about me, but it's fine. It doesn't, I don't really care about that. You can talk about me, keep talking. It's, it's totally fine. But, uh, I have friends who um, are in the NFL and the NBA. And there's an NBA player who played with Kwame that I know very well by the name of Itan Thomas. Itan is my buddy. Itan and I are cool. Uh, and Itan had me uh, speak at one of his events one year. And when I went to his event, I was standing next to an NFL player, a former NFL player by the name of Antoine Randall L. Now, this story, I promise you the story is going somewhere. So, so Antoine and I are just sitting there talking. And now my thought when I'm looking at Antoine, I'm like, wait a minute. This guy's the same height as me. He's about the same build as me. But Antoine is, is you know, a Boyce Watkins is no, was no Antoine and Randall L. Um, and maybe he's no Boyce Watkins. I don't know. But I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, wait a minute. This guy went to the NFL and was and won a Super Bowl. I ain't win no Super Bowl. This guy, I'm, I'm hating a little bit. I'm, this guy was a an All-American at Indiana University. He played for the Pittsburgh Steelers for, what, about 10, 12 years, something like that. And, uh, and Antoine, it, it also happens to be a really nice guy, really smart. Really, We had a really good conversation while we were sitting outside waiting for this panel to start. So let me tell you what about the conversation I had with Antoine and how, and, and, and how revealing this is. And I don't think he minds me sharing this. This was years ago. He didn't tell me anything personal, so I think it's okay for me to share. So we're talking, and I asked him, I said, I said, hey, man, you know that brain thing that they've been talking about in the NFL? This is about a decade ago. I said, how many of your friends have that brain damage thing? Now, it, and I remember he's in Pittsburgh. He played for Pittsburgh, where 
uh, where CTE was discovered. That doctor that Will Smith played in that movie was in Pittsburgh. His first case was Mike Webster, who uh, I think they called him Ironhead or something, or, or, or something like that. They made fun. Of, they were they 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 were they took pride in the fact that Mike took so many hits to the head. But Mike ended up, I think he ended up killing himself, right? Because again, suicide is connected to getting all those concussions. And so, uh, so I, I asked him. I said, I said, how many of your friends are affected with this this brain damage thing? And uh, and you know what he said? He said, he said, man, all my friends, man. I said, really? He said, yeah. And I said, really? So what what do you mean by that? He said, he said, man, you'll see a dude. He said, you'll see a guy who um, who. Um, you know, who uh, you, you you talk to and you haven't seen him for like five years. Right. And he'll be like, he'll be like, hey, what's up? Right. Like, 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 hey, good to see you. How you been, man? But like, you'll, you'll chop it up with him. Right. And then he said two minutes later, you'll, you'll talk to the guy again and he'll be like, he'll look at you and he'll be like, hey, what's up? Like he didn't just talk to you two minutes earlier. Like he literally forgot that he just talked to you two minutes earlier. Right. And uh, and those are some examples. And there were a lot of other examples. Now, let me tell you what happened. This was really interesting. This was this was an act of God. God meant for us to have this conversation. I do believe in stuff like that, um, and because let me, and let me tell you why. So Antoine, two about less than a year after that conversation, Antoine is on the cover of USA Today. And the headline is Antoine Randall L. Super Bowl champion Antoine Randall L. says, I wish I had never played football. I swear to God that literally not too long after we had that conversation, I'm just randomly talking to a dude. I happened to just meet at a conference. He, he's literally on USA Today saying, I wish I had never played football. Now, think about this. Think about this. I want you all to process this because I, I was a little black boy that had those NFL dreams, right? The white people put NFL players on TV. I thought that's what I was meant to do. But let me tell you all what, why, why this why this was a big deal. Let me tell you about Antoine Randall L. He was no average NFL player. This brother won a Super Bowl. He lived every dream. There's no dream that your child can have about sports that exceeds the achievements that Antoine Randall L. had. He was a wide receiver in the NFL for nine years. Um, he was a former player. Let me see. What, what else does it say? It says he's uh, he's a wide receivers coach now for the De Detroit Lions. Uh, he, he attended Indiana University where he played, uh, played at IU. In his career, let me see, um, at, at Thornton High School, he was All-American. Uh, as a player, he was a Super Bowl champion, first-team All-Pro, first-team All-American, Big Ten MVP, Big Ten Offensive Player of the Year, first-team All-Big Ten, two-time second-team All-Big Ten, Big Ten Freshman of the Year. So this guy had the, the best career you could possibly have. And think about this. What had to happen to you to make you say, I wish I'd never played football? That's like a billionaire saying, I wish I'd never had any money. I wish I was poor. I wish I'd never gotten this money in the first place. That's that for intelligent people. Now I'm talking to people that are critical thinkers here. That should make you stop and say, okay, tell me more because that don't add up to me that the best, you mean the best thing that ever happened to you in your life was the worst thing that ever happened to you in your life. That's crazy. Do me a favor, hit the thumbs up button, hit the thumbs up, share, subscribe button if you haven't done it yet. My Instagram is the real boys Watkins, by the way. Uh, that's on the screen. And also, I should remind you all that we we make movies. I know you guys may or may not know that, but we have a new movie that we, we're putting out now called uh, Till Death Do Us Part. And basically, it is uh, we we talk to a lot of couples uh, that have been married 20, 30, 40 years uh, so that we can learn how to love each other again. Uh, you cannot build wealth. You cannot build power without building family. If you do not learn how to build your families again, your community will never, ever succeed. The lowest net worth in America is that of a single black mother with children. Did y'all know that? The lowest net worth in America is that of a single black mother with children. The second lowest net worth in America is a black man with babies, mamas. Anybody who's ever had a bunch of babies, mamas and can't form a structured family, uh, chances are you're not going to have any money because all your money is going to go to child support court. So we, we're in a war. We're in a war. We're in a war with the people. The, we're in a war with the men who hate black women. We're in a war with the women who hate black men. So what I'm looking for are black people who want to learn how to love each other and learn how to manage healthy relationships and build structure and build legacy so you can actually develop generational wealth. That's why we made this movie. Uh, it's called Till Death Do Us Part, directed by Tierra K.J. Williams, a.k.a. Miss Black Hollywood. We're, gonna, we're not going to charge you money to watch this film. It is totally 
totally 100% free. But we spent tens of thousands of dollars making this movie. So we hope that you'll come and join us. We're going to show it for free. The URL is blackmovienight.net. We're going to show it on July 22nd. It's right there on the screen. That's blackmovienight.net. So bring your whole family because uh, if you want to build family, you got to relearn that. The, 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 the crack war and all the other things they did to you, that destroyed everything. That's that's why we we, we not only destroy our families, but we glorify that. We, glo we, we call men simps if they love a black woman. We call women weak if they love a black man. And I'm going to tell you, the strongest people in the community are the people that know how to work together because sometimes working with other black people ain't easy because there's a lot of mental health issues going on in our community. And only some of you are going to get that. Those of you who don't get it, go do something else. Go to, go to a, you know, go to a stripper party or something. But those of you who do get it, I hope you'll join us to watch this film. So feel free to come in and hang out with us. All right. So um, here, here's, here's, here's the next thing about Richard Sherman. So, so I, when I explain what's going on with Richard, let's talk about where he is, you know, where Richard Sherman is financially. Richard Sherman is a lot of money. His his last contract was about a $27 million deal. Uh, it was a three-year deal. He got a set a $3 million bonus with $7 million guaranteed. Uh, also, uh, in terms of Richard Sherman's life, one of the things that I think about is uh, not just the fact that he was a straight-A student and a Stanford University graduate and a very pro-Black kind of guy. Um, I also think about another guy that was a lot like Richard Sherman by the name of Dave Durison. Now, Dave Durison was a guy, um, I never met Dave, but Dave uh, played for the Chicago Bears, and Dave was the NFL Man of the Year. Uh, he won Super Bowls with the Bears back when they had the fridge and all that, and, um, and he was just a great player, and he was one of the best that there was. And Dave Durison was also known for being very, very intelligent. When Dave Durison, uh, he was actually featured in the Will Smith movie. He, he wasn't in it, but a, a guy played him in the in the uh, Will Smith movie. Let me tell you what where Dave Durison's role was. Dave Durison's role was kind of that of the Negro naysayer. You know how we have the Negro naysayers who find a problem with every solution, who block everything good for black people, who think that who hate hate on whatever you're trying to do, right? Well, Dave Durison was kind of like that. Dave Durison went to go work for the NFL. And basically, he was fighting against the players that were trying to get compensation for CTE. When players would come to him and say, hey, man, I can't think straight anymore. My brain isn't working anymore. Dave was the blocker. Dave was the guy that protected the NFL structure. That's just true. I mean, it, at least and, and, it de and that's definitely how they portrayed it in the movie. Well, let me tell you a little secret. Dave Durison ended up contracting CTE. Uh, and Dave Durison, um, I knew him indirectly because I happened to know a lady who was dating him at the time. Again, I have these weird random conversations where it just happens to lead to something big with CTE. So somehow God wants me in this conversation. I don't know why, but 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 let me tell I swear to God. So I had a friend who was dating him and uh, and she would call me and talk to, talk to me about Dave. Like, let me tell you what Dave did the other day. And I'm like, I don't even know Dave. I'm like, oh, well, he sounds interesting. He sounds like a smart guy. And uh, and we're, we're talking about Dave. And then she, she called me on a Tuesday to talk, to complain about Dave. And then like a Thursday or Friday, she calls me to tell me that Dave died. And I was like, whoa, how did he die? Well, he, he felt, again, because he was a smart man, he was smart enough to know what was going on with his mind and his body. And he felt something wasn't right. So he wrote a letter to his family basically saying, when I die, please make sure they study my brain so that we they can figure out what's wrong with me because I something isn't right. And so Dave, then he then uh, proceeds to shoot himself in the chest and he shot himself in the chest. Again, if, he, if you're killing yourself, a lot of people shoot themselves in the mouth or in the head. He didn't do that. He shot himself in the chest to preserve his brain, to make sure his brain was still available. And they studied his brain and he has CTE really, really badly. And so Dave Durison, when I think about um, uh, Richard Sherman's case, I thought I think about that conversation I had with Antoine Randall L. I think about the discussions and the many discussions I had with the close friend of Dave Durison and what happened with Dave. And the, the commonality to me, in my view, between Richard, Dave and Antoine, and I hope that, that Richard does not end up dead. I, I really do. I want him to be well, healthy and happy and everything else. But the commonality, the common thread is that these were all intelligent black men. These were not, you know, th th these guys, no disrespect, but th th none of these guys was like Allen Iverson. You know, Allen Iverson didn't give a damn. Allen Iverson was just kind of all over the place, right? No disrespect, but y'all know what it was, right? These guys weren't in that category. These guys were the kinds of men who probably, you know, did right by their woman, did right by their family, you know, preserve their wealth, you know, make strong, make solid economic decisions. And, and, there, and, and, and all of them went through um, all kinds of hell because of football. And, um, and, and, so, and so when I, when I see what's going on with, uh, with, with, uh, with Richard Sherman, 
I worry about the, the, the guy. I guess there's nothing you can do about it at this point. But I'm talking about it out loud because I really think we've got to sort of reexamine our relationship with football as black people. I know that they recruit the hell out of black boys for football because we're the best. We're the best. I mean, you know, we got the muscles. We got the speed. You know, I had a pretty good 40 yard dash back in the day. You know, they made them want to recruit me because I had the 40 yard dash and I had a big. I remember the day I ran against the football players. I had on this black tank top and all my muscles are bulging out and I'm and I'm I'm zipping down the down the track, blowing away. I literally raced the fastest running backs, wide receivers, defensive backs they had and and whooped them all in 100 meters. Like like I'm talking about like five or six meters like that's. What, what it was, right? And I remember how hard they worked to recruit me to play football. So there is a systematic racism that exists within sports that you think works to your benefit, but maybe it doesn't always work to your benefit like you think. And the reason I refer to it as a systematic racism is because you're talking about a, a, a set of racial outcomes that lie on the backs of a systematic set of forces, a systematic agenda to recruit as many black people as possible into this space. Right. I, so, so, you know, simple, simple racism or simple bias is when one, you know, when somebody doesn't like you because you're black or whatever. No, this is systematic because. There's no city you can go to anywhere in America where there isn't a whole string of coaches and, and admins out here trying to find the next NFL NBA superstar. And they're searching all through the hoods. Right. Because uh, the, the talent is there and the demand is there. Uh, also, it's systematic because when I grew up as a little boy and I turned on the TV and I'm looking to figure out who the hell I am. I don't know. You know, my sure my mother tells me stuff, but who didn't listen to your mama? Come on. Right. You, but you turn on the TV and you see this other black man who's making lots of money, who's out here doing amazing things in terms of sports. And you say, I want to be like that. You see, that's how they get black kids to want to do things is they pay. They pick the person that they want you to be and then they give them lots of money. And then you say, oh, I want to have money, too. So I'm going to imitate him. That's where that's how minstrel shows work so well. The kid working in the cotton club who's busting tables, you know, and for white folks, sees the guy on the stage who's doing the minstrel show. Yes, yeah, a boss, <laughs> right? And he says, "Ooh, they're clapping for him. Uh, they're giving him money. He's got all the attention. I want to be successful too, so I'm gonna copy that, right?" That's the brainwashing aspect. That's why it's so hard to fight with some of these Negroes because unfortunately, many of our people are just sick. Right. And it's not their fault. It's society. That's what they're given. That's the systematic aspect of this. That's why the control of black owned media, black owned educational systems is really important. Alicia and I, we only don't we only donate money to 100 uh, percent black owned schools. We don't give money to uh, big white universities. We're not doing any of that. We give money to schools that are run by black people because we need our black children to get a black education, not black children who get a white education and think that makes them into better black people. That's just not true. Take it from a guy who's got plenty of white education. I probably have more white education. I probably have more white education by the age of 25 than most people have in their whole entire life. So I'm a victim of it too, but I don't want to be a victim anymore. <laughs> I want to succeed and I want you to succeed. So, so with that said, um, when you're looking at, at a situation like this, the question that has to be asked, and this is only a question you can answer because the Lord knows I don't want to piss off all the football fans and football coaches that are out here. I've pissed off enough brothers by by challenging some of some of them in terms of how they view black women. Right. Uh, and, and I'm and I'm not anti football on any level. In fact, I'm a football fan. Right. Which probably makes me a little bit hypocritical, to be honest with you. But we've got to reexamine our relationship with football and we've got to ask ourselves, um, is it worth it? You know, if you knew that your son was going to be the next uh, Richard Sherman. Or the next Dave Durison, you know they were going to go win a Super Bowl. Uh, remember uh, Sherman? I think Sherman's won a Super Bowl. Did he? I think he won a Super Bowl with the with the Seahawks, right? Because I, I think with the Niners they got their butts kicked. But I, I, but maybe I'm getting it wrong. But I, I think he's won a Super Bowl. But at least he's been in the Pro Bowl. Y'all can help me in the chat if, if you can correct that. Um, but uh, but you know Dave Durson won a Super Bowl. Antoine Randall L won a Super Bowl. So if you knew your child was going to be the next Dave Durson, the next Antoine Randall L, the next Richard Sherman. Would you sign your child up for that? Give me a yes or, a yes or no in the chat. Would you be okay with that? Like, are you okay with that path? Right? Um, you know, because the thing is that sports seems to come with a gift and a curse, uh, particularly football. It comes with a gift and a curse. The gift is, it's like a deal with the devil. The gift is money, uh, maybe some women, 
you know, whatever, right? All kinds of, you know, other things that you get. They come, you know, you get money. Women automatically think you're more attractive. Uh, you get fame. You get um, the chance to say, look, mama, I made it. But the trade-off is that you might have a very, very short life, right? And Because, because remember that, um, that the NFL, the CTE is not the only thing that kind of happens when you're talking about uh, playing at that level. Playing at that level requires you you're competing every day against big, gigantic, superhuman men who are desperate for an opportunity, many of whom are taking insane amounts of steroids, right? Which which might mean that you might have to take steroids too to compete with them, right? So drug addiction is a big problem that a lot of NFL players have. Uh, a lot of NFL players leave the league. They're addicted to painkillers, painkillers like oxycodone and all that stuff, the oxys are now being uh, banned by the government. These companies are being sued by the government right now because they got the whole country hooked on painkillers. Do you think, uh, you, you, I mean, I, I know a lot of NFL players who can't stop taking the painkillers because the pain only gets worse. You get older, shit just starts hurting just cause you're 40. I don't know anybody, any 40 pluses in the room, you know, 45 year olds, you know, kind of mad. Cause you just like, why is my knee hurting? I didn't even play basketball yesterday and you don't know why. Well, that's what happens, right? You get older. Stuff just hurts just because, right? And I can't imagine how it must feel when you've been taking massive hits to the body and to the brain that are that pretty much are the same as you being in 10,000 car crashes, right? Literally, that's what they've compared. They've compared, uh, they've compared a lot of the NFL brain damage to being in like 5,000, 10,000 car crashes. And so, uh, so, so at the end of the day, you got to be able to think your way through this and decide, you know, is it worth it? Is it worth it? Right. Um, now, let's see. Ty Robinson. Oh, he said he ain't a simp, though. OK, so, Ty, you about to you about to be booty, brother. So get on out of here with your with your weak ass. All right. So so here, here's the deal. Um, let me let me read some of this to you in terms of symptoms of CTE. Um, I did some research on this and I'm going to read some of this to you that I thought was really interesting. I want you to at, tell me, give me a yes or no if you're noticing uh, any connection between uh, Richard Sherman's alleged behavior that night and symptoms of CTE. So according to concussionfoundation.org, uh, here are some symptoms of CTE. Um, impulse control problems, the, the difficulty controlling your impulses. Aaron Hernandez, uh, Ashe to him. Uh, that was a guy who had CTE very, very badly. And Aaron Hernandez uh, was, was a young guy uh, and he would go to the club and the, the feeling you have, you ever have that feeling when you pissed off at somebody and you would like to kill them, but you don't because you don't want to go to prison for life? Well, Aaron Hernandez wouldn't just feel like, I want to kill that person. He would go kill that person. He would literally go kill them because, because he had so much damage right here in the front of the brain. Pay attention now. I'm not a brain expert, but, uh, but, but this is some of what I've read. He had damage right here to the front of the brain. They call that the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is the part of you that stops the rest of you. It's the part of you that says to you, hey, you could go kill that guy because he's sleeping with your woman. But if you do, you're going to go to prison for the next 50 years. Is that something that you want to do? And your frontal lobe, prefrontal cortex <clears throat> says, no, we don't want to go to prison. No, no. And then you don't do it. Right. Well, Aaron Hernandez was taking a lot of these hits. Boom, boom, boom. Think about it. You're a tight end. You run across the field. You make the big catch. You cracking somebody right here. Boom, 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 over and over and over again. So Aaron Hernandez had lost a lot of his impulse control. So some symptoms, I'm going to keep reading the symptoms. I want you to tell me if you saw any of this with Richard Sherman. Uh, because remember, when Aaron Hernandez gets hit in the head, who's hitting him? Who's who's clashing with him like, like a ram? The clash is coming from a Richard Sherman, the defensive back. So the defensive back is lowering his head. Then you're not supposed to lower your head, but y'all know what football is. You know how it works. You know people crack heads in football. So, so. Sherman lowers his head to take down Hernandez. Hernandez lowers his head to take the hit. Both of them end up with brain damage because they basically slammed into each other in this car crash because both of them run the 40-yard dash in about 4.3 seconds, which means that they're coming at each other. We have large masses of bodies coming at each other at a very rapid pace, and then, boom, the explosion happens, right? And, and white people are entertained. They think that's really great. Yeah, yeah, kill him, bro, kill him, right? Okay. Let's keep going. Uh, other symptoms of CTE, impulse control problems, aggression. He was very aggressive that night, wasn't he? Uh, mood swings. 
Well, if you say you want to kill yourself, that's that will probably qualify as a mood swing. Depression. A lot of depressed people say they're suicidal, so that fits. So a lot of suicidal people are probably depressed. Paranoia, anxiety. Let's keep going. Cognitive problems. Most patients with CTE eventually experience progressive problems with thinking and memory, including short-term memory loss, confusion, impaired judgment, dementia. Some of these guys are in like 38 years old with the brain of a 75-year-old with dementia. They said a 2020 study from uh, BABUCLF Brain Bank suggested that problems with sleep, specifically symptoms associated with REM behavior disorder, may be related to CTE pathology. So that means that a lot of these guys can't sleep. So Antoine Randall L., the guy I told you about earlier, the guy who won the Super Bowl, the guy that I talked to for a while, uh, that was one of the things I remember him mentioning to me was he said, having, he said, yes, yeah, sometimes I have trouble sleeping or, or remembering little things like you might go pick up your daughter from school and then you can't remember how to get back to your house. Right. So 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 I'm looking at the Richard Sherman thing and I'm sitting there thinking, you know, it made me really sad that I did not get a chance to play college football. I really, really admire those athletes. Those guys are uh, extraordinarily talented. And uh, and there was nothing I would have wanted more when I was 18 years old than to be on the football or basketball team. You know, I just didn't have it. I didn't have what it took. I was a good athlete, but I wasn't great. Um, now I look back on that and I thank God that I was not cursed with that level of talent because uh, I don't really know. I know that at the age of 50 that I am right now, there is some chance that I would be significantly impaired and perhaps even dead. And, uh, and I'm going to tell you, as a 50-year-old, I live a pretty good life. My life got better as I got older. Every year of my life is better than the last year. And, uh, and I just don't really know if I, I know for myself, it wouldn't have been worth it. But again, I'm not knocking anybody that wants to play football. I know that's a hard trade-off. It's a very hard trade-off because football is such a significant part of our culture. It's such a significant part of our culture. You know, it's uh, I mean, every city has the football leagues and I see guys that are coaches and and these guys are important. I love these guys. You know, I guess uh, I guess the Negro naysayers will call them simps because they actually care about these kids. Like, well, you you simping. Why would you take care of somebody kid and ain't your kid? You did babysitting. Right. So, so but so but, but I don't call them simps. I call them heroes. I call them the bonus dads of our community. These are the dads that matter because a lot of these kids ain't got no daddy. Right. So a lot of times the football coach uh, that you grew up with, the coach that motivated you to do your best, to push through your difficulties and to overcome challenges, that becomes the person you never forget for the rest of your life. Because I know I personally learned lessons in sports that made me successful in business, that made me successful in college, that made me successful in everything that I do. And I am a successful man and I'm a successful man because of many of the lessons I learned in sports. So I would almost say at the end of the day, when I think about Richard Sherman, I wish him the best. Um, I am not in any way uh, making light of the situation. Uh, between you and I, I would not be surprised if they did try to send him to prison over this. Uh, the world is not very forgiving. Uh, I don't know if he's going to play football again. Uh, he's still got some you know, football in him. He's 31 years old. Uh, maybe he's got some good PR specialists that can help him rebuild his brand after this whole you know difficult situation. Um, and I hope that that happens. But don't. But I would also not be surprised if they just throw him out like they do everybody else. Like E40 said a, a long time ago in the song, he was talking about young rappers who think they're on top of the world because some white person came along and gave you money. He said they'll find a new nigga next year. And as great as Richard Sherman is, as, as, as extraordinary of a talent as he is, as much as he's given to the world, there's another 21-year-old somewhere that they could go recruit to play, come play for the 49ers uh, that they would gladly pick uh, if he's less trouble than a Richard Sherman uh, in terms of, of of what Richard's going through and, and the challenges that lie ahead. So I wish him the very best. I really do. And I also, last piece I want to throw out to you, you brothers is um, I really want to encourage any black man who's listening and any person who has a black man in his house, whether it's your husband, your uncle, or your son, um, really, I hope you will get them to really reconsider uh, drugs and alcohol. I know everybody in the world tells you that they're, they're smoking a little bit. Smoking and drinking is cool. I know everybody tells you that, that there's something wrong with you if you don't drink. And, uh, and But I'm just here to be the, the one lone voice in the woods, perhaps. I don't know who will say to you, I wouldn't fuck with any of that shit with a 10-foot pole. Uh, studies show, I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm a reader, I'm a researcher. Studies show that, um, that actually alcohol 
is the worst drug in the world. It's worse. It's even worse than crack. Now, you, you would say, well, how's alcohol worse than crack? Well, the reason alcohol is, which again, Richard Sherman allegedly was drunk that night. Um, the reason alcohol is worse than crack is because when you add up the amount of damage that's done to people's lives around the world because of liquor, it far exceeds the damage from any other drug. If you look at the number of people that have that die every year, you talk about Black Lives Matter. You really want to save some black lives? Go look at, at, at the consumption of drugs and alcohol and what that's done to people. I'm not just talking about the crack era where you had a bunch of addicts and people going to prison over drugs and getting killed over drugs. If you just look at liquor alone, think about how many times, how many of you, give me a yes or no, give me a yes or no. How many of you know some guy that went to the club and got drunk and got into some old gangster shit, got into a situation where somebody got shot at the club because somebody said something wrong or you stepped on my baby mama's big toe or, or you disrespected me. How many of y'all know a black man who's who either gotten killed, gotten shot, or got or gone to jail over something stupid that happened in the club. And, and, and I'm going to tell you this. The reason these things happen is because when you are drunk and when you are high, you are not in your right mind. When you are drunk and when you are high, you are the exact opposite of what a soldier needs to be. Uh, and, and as a black man, you have to be somewhat of a soldier because the world is designed to take you down. Everybody wants to take you down. So in order for you to win a battle, you have to be alert. So as Malcolm X used to say, the white, the white man will sell you the liquor bottle and then lock you up for being drunk. And the reason he'll sell you the liquor bottle is for the same reason that men try to get some men try to get women drunk if they want to try to take advantage of them sexually. Right. They want to get you drunk because if you are out of your mind, if you're not paying attention, then people can take advantage of you. People can exploit you. People can sneak up and kill you or they can find a reason to incarcerate you because you did something while you were knocked out that you don't even remember. I felt really sorry for this kid. There was a 22 year old I saw who took a, 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 a he, he took a hit of a blunt. So my, his friend had it was his friends were smoking a blunt and you know how it is. Everybody wants to be cool. Everybody wants to fit in. I don't want to fit into anything. I don't want to fit into a, a sick dying culture. I don't participate in any of that. And, and I didn't do that when I was 20. I'm going to tell you the truth. And so but this guy, he wanted to fit in. So everybody was smoking. So he wanted to smoke. So he took the blunt and he took one hit on this blunt. I swear to God. So he took one hit on the blunt and the blunt was laced with PCP. So let me tell you what he did. He then for that day. He did a bunch of really crazy, outrageous, illegal stuff that he does not even remember. He says that his friends told him that he shot a girl and killed her. He carjacked somebody and pistol whipped them or whatever and did something else. So this kid was in jail about to get the death penalty. Again, they don't have any they don't have no leeway on these dudes. Like they, they were about to get this kid the death penalty. Right. And, and they asked us, so what do you think? What punishment do you think you deserve? Because, you know, you got the white guy saying, so what do you think? Do you think that you do you think that you deserve a, a punishment for this? And he said, yeah, I think I deserve to die for that. I, whatever I did, I don't remember it, but I think I deserve the death penalty because what I did was terrible. So he was clearly a good person. He was clearly somebody that didn't want to be that person. He wasn't saying like, yeah, I, I would do it again. Thug, you know, I'm a thug. I'm a killer. I'm a gangster. He wasn't doing that. He was like he was a scared little kid. And I'm sitting there thinking, who mentored this guy, right? Who gave him a false impression of what manhood is supposed to look like? You know, anybody who tells you you're supposed to be banging over breakfast and just doing any stupid thing, it, 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 that's not a person teaching you how to be a man. That's a person teaching you how to be a victim. That's a person teaching you how to die, right? And, and in the music, every day they teach black men how to die. They, when they're marketing drugs and alcohol to you, market, marketing things to you that are illegal to market in the United States, by the way, it's illegal to market some of these drugs that they that, that rappers like Future and others will, will easily put in a song. You, you can't market those things. Companies are getting sued for billions of dollars for marketing those things. But, but they will market it to you all day long because they don't care about you. They want you dead. They want, they want you locked up. They want you high and drunk. They want you to not be able to come through for your family because ain't no drug addict, ain't no drunk going to really be able to be solid for their children. So I'm really just talking to the people that understand, that are trying to understand. Uh, and, 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 I, and I continue this. I will never stop. I will never stop. I don't care. You can, you can call me all kinds of names. I've been called a sip. I've been called this. I've been called that. And, and I don't care because a real man ain't got to prove that he's a real man. And I'm trying to give something, hopefully, and I hope other people will join me because I'm not the only one who, who thinks this way. There's millions of you out here, and I'm hoping to that I can use my little platform to give you the courage to be you and to fight against this toxic death culture that's being mass promoted and marketed to black men.
because that's one of the reasons that your community is failing. A lot of it is because your men are being set up to fail at an early age. You get a kid hooked on pills at 19 years old, there's a good chance he's going to be worthless for the rest of his life. All his children, by the time he's 35, his kids will hate him. He will have no wealth. He's going to die a complete disgrace to everybody around him. And you, there's no other way around that. You have to nip it in the bud. You've got to confront it where it lies. And it all links back to systematic white supremacy. Why is this systematic? Because radio stations are systematic. They are systematic distributions of a message that is toxic to black people, right? The systematic racism occurs through the music. It occurs through uh, the television set. It occurs through all the all the football camps. They want to sign your kid up for brain damage. I'm not hating on football now. Don't get me wrong. I'm still a football fan. Go play football. It's cool, but you got to think about these things. You can't act like it's not happening, right? Uh, there, there's, systematic, there, there's systematic racism everywhere, and people don't even see it. Because you up here worried about whether some white lady called you the N-word when she was at the grocery store. I don't give a damn what some toothless old lady had to say. I'm looking at the damn system. You got to nip the problem in the bud. If you do not do that, you will always be confused by the racism. So I'm going to go. That's my two cents. God bless Richard Sherman. I wish him the very, very best. I admire this guy immensely. I think that he uh, is an asset to the world. And I really hope that he can overcome this. And I wish him the very best. So, um, so, it, so you guys have a wonderful day. Please take care and uh, please share this with your sons. And I hope that they'll listen. Uh, at least they can't say nobody told them. So y'all have a good day. Please hit the thumbs up button, share, subscribe. But I want to mention to you guys also that the Dr. Boyce breakdown.com is where you can get an audio version of this podcast. I'm on Apple, Spotify, all that stuff. So go to the Dr. Boyce breakdown, look it up. I need you guys help. Cause you know, white, if I'm, if I'm white, I'm not going to promote something like this. White, white people, white people don't, don't support any of this. Like there's nothing that they're ever going to do because this is not something that I think they would, if I'm white, I wouldn't support it because this is true black power that we're talking about here. So I really would love for you guys to help us build on this. Um, and I appreciate those of you who, um, who get what we're saying over here. Okay. So, uh, hit the thumbs up button, share subscribe button. And also black movie night is on the 22nd. We're going to show our new film uh, called till death do us part and uh, by Tierra KJ Williams. And, uh, you can watch it for free. So go to, uh, sorry, I'm gonna give it's black movie I'm gonna put that URL on the screen, black movie Thursday, July 22nd. So take care, everybody. Have a good day. I'll see you soon. Peace. Here we are, clan the isms, cataclysm, great. Our people out here struggling, trying to make it in this state. Everybody out here doing it, but we the ones who late. Now, family, we the ones who gotta delegate. Get that money in the power, never be fake. Stick to co sign for three. What did he say? Uh, create jobs, support our own. Educate the same and buy back your home. Got three degrees, triple ten. Three PhDs, now we on the CNN. DBTV, let's talk about negligence. Ignorance is bliss, but we can turn it to intelligence. Please, none of what you hear, half of what you see. Let's break it down here on Dr. Boyce TV. Here we are.